The best video game script ever written was penned in 975 AD. Hyperbole. Statements or claims not meant to be taken literally. For example, Dakota claimed that the best video game ever written was done so far before the concept of video games even came to be. The subtext of this hyperbole is that Dakota thinks that Beowulf should have been a slam dunk game. And Dakota also hates talking in the third person, but here we are. The story of Beowulf comes to us in the form of an epic poem. Found as a subsection of the larger work known as the Noel Codex, this adventure is far shorter than the Greek poems, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. This is one of the oldest known English texts, written in a very different style of Old English. And when I say that, don't think of Shakespeare or even Chaucer. No, it's older and even more incomprehensible. Just for reference, I'll read you the first line and then show you what that original text looked like. Lo, the prowess of people king, of spear-armed Danes in days long sped. We have heard, and what honor, the athlings have won. And here's what that looked like. It's some form of elvish. I can't read it. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. The only reason this episode exists is because I was stupid enough to buy the tie-in game for the movie for the 360. Yeah, um... Yeah, it's awful. The only other information I have regarding this topic comes from my friends back in junior high who were a part of History Club. They were allowed to see the movie after reading the poem, and they told me it has everything you could possibly want. It's got gore. It's got violence. It's got... John Malkovich, a common ground for sixth grade tweens and Vikings alike. Before I give a summary of the poem, I'm gonna put up a spoiler warning, not just for the thousand year old poem, but for these following movies. So if you don't want them spoiled, there's a chapter select below or save this video for later and come back. Now, if you're a high school student tasked with reading the poem and you don't wanna do that, get ready to take notes. First, Hrothgar, king of the Danes, and his people are tormented by the monster Grendel after building a mead hall near his cave. In the original text, Grendel is a creature that has no direct description. The widely accepted visualization of Grendel is that of a shadow walker. He ransacks the hall a few times before the king calls in the Ghostbusters. Second, Beowulf arrives after hearing of Grendel's exploits. The protagonist takes the challenge of besting his foe with nothing more than his might alone. Third, Hrothgar's thane Unferth interjects during Beowulf's welcoming ceremony, mentioning that Beowulf lost a swimming contest against a warrior named Brekka, doing so as a sort of way to question the validity of our hero's might. Beowulf then steps up and tells the full story of the swimming match, where he wore a full suit of armor, fought nine sea monsters, and did it all with his hands tied behind his back and a blindfold on. Okay, so those last two were jokes, but in all honesty, no iteration of this story can make the exchange between these two characters here sound any less childish and silly. After finishing the story of the swimming race, Beowulf then snaps back, asking Unferth about some fratricide that he had taken part in, which not only gets him to pipe down, but also embarrasses him so bad that he gives Beowulf his family's sword that's instilled with magic powers, and that'll come back into the story later. Fourth, after the feast, our protagonist goes out to 1v1 Grendel, Fox only, final destination, no items. After Beowulf tears off Grendel's arm, the foe retreats with a mortal wound. Arriving back at his cave, Grendel's mother sees her son and is enraged. There's also no visual description of his mother, though she is said to be the same beast, just much bigger and much more powerful. However, back at the Mead Hall, everyone thinks that the trouble is over. So after some more celebrations have ceased, hands shaken and gold given, Beowulf sets off for his home land. But then Grendel's mom starts tormenting the Danes, so the king quickly calls Beowulf back. Fifth, being a man of his word, Beowulf comes back and finishes what he started. The fight this time, though, is a lot harder, but thanks to Unferth's magic sword, as well as a second magic sword that just so happens to be nearby in this fight, Beowulf takes home win number two. Six, after another feast, more gold and more mead, Hrothgar promises strong allyship between the Geats and the Danes and the two part ways. Seventh, Beowulf returns back home and the king gives him half his land. Then a few years later, the king dies, giving him the whole land. Eighth, and finally, 50 years pass before a dragon attacks the kingdom. Beowulf, being too prideful, decides to defend his kingdom on his own. He ends up beheading the dragon, but not before it gets one nasty bite in, lethally poisoning Beowulf. Wolf. The town mourns the loss of their great king, they bury all of the dragon's treasure with him in the tomb, and that's the end of the story. 
If you're watching this video because you needed more information than the SparkNotes could give and you still didn't want to read the text, then let me reassure you, this is truly that simple of a story. Occasionally it gets lost in tangents about weapon lore, history of the land, or character ancestry, but that's stuff for more of the hardcore history crowd. Thematically, the story serves as a humbling note that even the gods among us are susceptible to deathly pride. For the most part, this is prime adaptation material, partly due to the fact that the story of Beowulf started as an oral tradition that made it to the era of modern recorded history. This lineage makes it ripe for direct retellings as well as creative interpretations, and it serves the narrative tradition. Before we get into why this makes for one of the best video game stories, we should first look at how films use the source material, because there's more nuance to it than simply making a faithful adaptation. There's an intangible spirit that this poem has, which is hard to replicate. While it's not the most adapted historically iconic story, it has around 10 movies to its name. Before getting to them, there are a few issues that creatives have to deal with while adapting the poem that are worth noting. Like I said before, Grendel and the other foes don't have a detailed description. There are some generally agreed upon visual depictions that could match what the creature was supposed to look like, but nothing is is concrete. Second, the mix of Christian and pagan traditions. This was a developing time for this region and ideas were starting to clash as history began recording. Third, Hollywood wants a B-plot. The B-plot in this poem is the theme of pride kills. The original narrative is more or less to the point. This means that if you want to go from text to screen, Beowulf is going to have to find love, face inner demons, or like other great adaptations of epic poems, become an overnight bluegrass sensation. Handling this edition either requires surgical accuracy or a full commitment to a new angle. These film adaptations fall into one of three categories. I don't know why I felt the need to break down further something so niche. It doesn't, doesn't really need that rigid structure. But I also don't know why I didn't read this poem when it was assigned to me in the first place 10 some years ago. And now in my late 20s, I'm like, hey, you know what? It's time to spend a month of your life getting real into the deep, dark secrets of Beowulf. Maybe, maybe I need more structure. Anyway, those fall into direct adaptations, sci-fi adaptations, and mixed adaptations. Direct adaptations are seen in 2005's Beowulf and Grendel, 2007's direct-to-sci-fi channel film Grendel, and Robert Zemeckis' motion capture animated film also titled Beowulf. We'll talk about that last one later, as it's the most famous film adaptation, and it's a good summation for the whole adaptation endeavor. The other two films are straightforward retellings, the only major difference being that they focus on the first two acts of the story, opting to leave out the dragon fight at the end. This leaves the writers more room to flesh out the interpersonal side of the story. After all, main points will live on, but naturally the dialogue will change between retellings. Aside from that, the only things that make these two films stand out are the added focus on Grendel's new backstory in the 2005 version, and in the 2007 version they give Beowulf a sidekick named Finn. But otherwise, you get what you were probably expecting. Neither of these films did well critically, nor did they capture the spirit of the poem. Beowulf and Grendel suffered an odd fate where the making of documentary won awards and the film itself largely went forgotten. This is due to the chaotic conditions the production was made under. And the other film is a sci-fi channel original, so it's fake was doomed to obscurity from the conception. Direct adaptations of this poem require a near flawless precision, as there's not a lot to work with, and the elements required are all action-based, meaning that the downtime between fights needs to be brief. The poem, for better or worse, is all gas and no breaks, yet these adaptations linger in between too long, trying to add context and meaning to fights that don't need it. This isn't your typical hero's journey arc, it's Beowulf. He's here to kick ass and drink me in the kegs of run dry. Up next we have the sci-fi adaptations, which oddly enough doesn't include the sci-fi channel Beowulf. Sorry for any confusion. If you need a refund, it's it's over there.
if there was a time and place for pure action, then this is it. Here we have 1999's Beowulf starring Raiden from Mortal Kombat and 2008's Outlander featuring Jesus himself. The first film is a more direct retelling, with all three fights intact. The setting is a mix of sci-fi, fantasy, and post-apocalypse, and the biggest change being Grendel's mom is both a succubus and the final boss. In this adaptation, the force of evil has more motivation to torment the current inhabitants as they were colonized and pushed out by the current king. This has all of your quintessential 90s action film stuff. You got comical over-editing, terrible audio, but it's nevertheless a fun time that clearly focuses on the action and thus keeps the spirit of Beowulf alive. The second film is 2008's Outlander, which was a financial nuke. With a budget of $47 million and a total box office return of $7 million. Starring Jim Caviezel of Passion of the Christ fame, Outlander takes a much different approach. In this version, Kanan, our stand-in for Beowulf, doesn't have an immense strength, but rather he's a man from the future. The stand-in for Grendel's mother being a dog-like alien creature that has been on the hunt for Beowulf after him and his people desecrated their alien planet. Outlander takes the source material and adds enough to make it stand out, but not too much as to obfuscate the original text. It even goes so far as to keep the moral lesson of the poem, by insinuating that the beast is a manifestation of Kanan's pride and arrogance. It's one of the most bold adaptations that manages to ride the line between homage and originality. With the sci-fi adaptations, we see that having an understanding of how important combat is to the source material in conjunction with light-hearted, fun approaches makes for a viewing experience that captures the spirit of the poem. While not critically appreciated or financially viable, in the grand scheme of things, these two films do a pretty good job of maintaining the oral tradition. Third is mixed adaptations. These are films that take elements from Beowulf and combine them with other stories. These include Jack and the Witch, The Thirteenth Warrior, and Grendel, Grendel, Grendel. The oldest visual adaptation of Beowulf is 1967's Jack and the Witch. This was the 11th feature film from the storied Toei Animation Company. This film combines parts of Jack and the Beanstalk with Beowulf. Jack and the Witch is one of the strangest anime films I have ever seen. If you didn't tell me anything going into it, I would have thought that this was some long lost Hanna-Barbera production. As for the connection with the source material, it's rather hard to spot. The stories are cut up, mixed around, and new parts are added to the point where it feels wholly original. But you've got your journey to a new land, a fight against three monsters of increasing size and difficulty, but they change the ending to be more kid friendly. Otherwise, the story elements are all there. It's a strange film and the pace does not let up for a second. The third the 13th Warrior starring Antonio Banderas is an adaptation of Michael Crichton's novel, Eaters of the Dead. It retells the first two acts of the poem from the perspective of Ahmed, the court poet, a stand-in for Wheeloff, Thane of Beowulf. The perspective shift in addition to a tribe of cannibals led by the Grendel stand-in are the only major differences here. Our third and final film in this category is Grendel, 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 an Australian animated film from 1981 that steps to the other side of the poem to see things from the monster's point of view. The film is based off of John Gardner's 1971 book titled Grendel. It's a comedic look at the formation of Hrothgar's empire and how Grendel mistakenly becomes an antagonistic force due to his awkward nature and overbearing strength. Here we find the best example of Beowulf in film form, which is odd given the comedic and almost parody-like nature of the piece. It's able to do so through a very deep understanding of the poem, its history, and lore, and for the first time painting Beowulf as the villain. What we get is a movie that understands how to properly flesh out the interpersonal narratives in a new and inventive way, while also staying true to the lineage that birthed it. Now there's one film on that list that I showed earlier that didn't make the cut for any of the categories, and that's Hal Hartley's 2001 film, No Such Thing. Wikipedia has it listed under Beowulf movies, but when you click the link, the top line stresses that it is loosely based on the poem. After watching the film, I struggled to see the connection loose, tight, or otherwise. All I could find was a monster and Sarah Polly, who was in Beowulf and Grendel and now plays the main character. But that's it. So I did some more digging and found out that the only place this comparison was being made was on Wikipedia, a book from 2013, and an IMDb trivia fact that only four of seven people found interesting. Following the Wikipedia source led me to the book Beowulf on Film, Adaptations and Variations by Nicholas Haydock and E.L. Risden. 
The authors of the book pose an interesting argument for the similarities between No Such Thing and Beowulf. However, it's a subjective argument with good points, but that doesn't make it fact. So I searched for interviews with the writer or director in hopes that they would mention the poem. I found a few interviews where Hal Hartley talks about the difficulties of making and releasing the film, but nothing that I was looking for. But then I thought, maybe it's the marketing material. That seems like something that could tie these two together. However, it was only shown in three theaters before getting sent straight to obscure home video. United Artists wanted this project canned and fast. Considering the time period and early scenes like this, Waiting online at the airport, I saw two men get caught trying to smell radioactive materials out of the country. It's like my mum used to say, the world's a dangerous and uncertain place. A few moments here and there of selflessness and affection are about as good as life gets. It's clear why this wouldn't have gone over well with audiences at the time. This film wouldn't see the light of day for quite a while, which means it couldn't have been the marketing material as there was next to none. So at this point, their argument is more or less conjecture. And I'm not saying that these two are wrong for theorizing and providing subjective proof, but on the same side of the coin, writer Adriana Crichoon wrote a stellar review for the Brooklyn Rail that in far fewer words does the same thing, likening the movie to a litany of fairy tales, King Kong, and most Interestingly, Mary Shelley's 1818 novel Frankenstein, comparing the boss to Dr. Frankenstein, creating a media monster that didn't ask to be created and didn't want to be immortal, being mobbed by people who are angry at its very existence. Her comparisons are equally arguable and just as valid, and by that token, I too can make the argumentative framework that no such thing has more in common to Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve's 1740s fairy tale Beauty and the Beast, where we see Belle and Beatrice and the monster monster obviously being the beast. The beast has one desire to stop existing, and Belle seeks out to help him do just that. In doing so, the beast is offered one act of kindness, something that he rarely sees. Substitute the assisted suicide for a kiss, and you have the Disney version repackaged for Disney adults. To be fair, Adriana also makes this point in her article, but when I first saw this movie, this was the first thing that my mind jumped to. All three of these readings are valid in their interpretations, but not set in stone as fact. But is no such thing a Beowulf movie. Theoretically, yes, if you agree with Nicholas Haydock and E.L. Resden, but strictly speaking, there's no hard evidence to say yes. Now it's time to circle back and talk about the most popular film adaptation of this story. That's Robert Zemeckis' 2007 film, Beowulf. Image Mover Digitals, an offshoot of Zemeckis' main company, had just seen success with the 2004 hit Polar Express. Given that, as well as Zemeckis' clout in the industry, this was for sure to be an easy investment. Who wouldn't want to be in a film with the guy that made Forrest Gump and Back to the Future? The screenplay for this film had some serious star power behind it, penned by Neil Gaiman of Coraline fame and Roger Avery who co-wrote Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs. The writers have stated in interviews that early drafts for the retelling had started as far back as 1995. Zemeckis showed interest in the project early on, which might lead you to believe that he really enjoyed the source material he was adapting. So right now I can only say that this has nothing to do with the Beowulf that you were forced to read in junior high school. It's clear from watching a lot of behind the scenes content that the story of Beowulf took a back seat. Image Mover Digital and Robert really only cared for the technical side of the project, and Gaiman and Avery focused on the oral tradition of Beowulf, getting to reshape the narrative for modern audiences. So to expect a true retelling of the story would be to not understand who's at the helm. However, audiences in 2007 didn't have that in hindsight and instead got... It's all about eating, <laughs> drinking, killing, and fornicating. I can't wait. Do I detect a note of sarcasm? Are you kidding me? This baby is off the charts! The story starts out the same. Beowulf arrives and is almost immediately tasked with taking out Grendel. He does so with no armor. Grendel escapes, cries to his mom. Grendel dies. Beowulf kills the mom. The big change in this is that the king dies and Beowulf takes over as the king of the Danes. So instead of going back home to fight the dragon, the dragon comes to him. Beowulf kills the dragon and dies and that's it. That's not an accurate plot synopsis, but it's enough so that what I'm about to tell you is coherent coherent at the very least. Here's the big twist. Hrothgar has cheated on his wife with Grendel's mom years before the story took place, making Angelina Jolie more into a succubus instead of a monster, thus making Grendel the bastard son of Hrothgar. When Beowulf goes to kill Grendel's mom, he ends up sleeping with her too, which wouldn't be much of an issue other than the fact that Hrothgar promised Beowulf his throne, land, and wife upon death. 
before expediting that process in front of everyone at the feast. This comes back up later as the dragon is then the bastard son of Beowulf. The thematic elements on display here are these two men's lustful desires turning into the very monster that ends up killing them. If I'm being honest, I really like this element of the story if it happened in any other movie. This edition was not received well. However, the trend of Hrothgar sleeping with Grendel's mom is not a new one. We see a similar storyline played out in the 1999 film as well as the 2000 version. The original poem's theme is a call to fight hubris or overbearing pride. Changing that to fighting against lust changes the entire dynamic of the fight drastically. Our hero here is not the titan that we see in the poem. He is portrayed far more human than ever before. But I think the reason fans of the source material tend to view this film negatively is that Beowulf isn't supposed to be a conflicted figure. He's a big, strong man who loves saving people not for the fame, but for the adventure. The theme of hubris is merely subtext that rests gently on top of the story, never calling attention to itself. In this day and age, we don't get heroes who are still able to be compelling while retaining a simplicity. Beowulf is one of the few remaining storied protagonists where the main character just gets to do fun stuff full stop. What better way to tell this story with a simple yet hardcore character than with a wild new form of animation? This should have been a recipe for success, but because Zemeckis' feeling towards the poem and focus on the technical aspect, we get something that just doesn't work. What we find with 2007's Beowulf is a clear example of just how hard it is to adapt this poem into film. How do you keep the oral tradition alive? How do you depict monsters that have no visualization? And how do you keep fans of the source material happy? It's a nearly impossible task for filmmakers, but not every medium has this issue. Most of these films are missing something that makes this story timeless, which is the simple yet pure power fantasy. Like I mentioned before, I think the reason Beowulf works as a character is because he's a hero for the sake of adventuring. Modern movies want to create layered stories that birth complex situations and characters. After a lifetime of watching and analyzing films, we want these deep and flawed characters, which is a speed bump in the fun, positive power fantasy that this poem provides. However, where the movies fail, video games are ready to take up the torch. So obviously, we should start with the only game to bear the title of Beowulf. <laughs> If the film couldn't get the narrative right, there was no chance that Ubisoft was going to fix it. What they do here is a simple three-act structure where the middle act uh, just isn't in the movie. The first and the third recreate the film with a few variations here and there, but the second act takes place during the 50-year time skip after Grendel's mother is supposedly killed. This second act is a totally new area. None of this comes up in the film and none of it comes up in the poem. This means the writers had free range to get really creative, but instead you go on three separate adventures that have no ties to the final act. You fight a skeleton dog, storm Helheim, and fight Brekka. You know, the guy from the swimming match who wants to fight for some reason. Once you complete each of these adventures, you immediately move on to the next with no clear goal in mind. This section should have been the best in the entire game because it's adventuring for adventuring's sake. But with no clear sensical motive from either the protagonist or the villains, these feel less like an adventure and more like you're being dragged to the supermarket by your parents. All the complaints I had about the narrative in the film stand, but now with the added disappointment that the opportunity for fun additions was squandered. But that doesn't matter if the game makes you feel like Beowulf, right? I have no idea. The game can't do that right either. On the face of it, this is a beat em up with a morality system and an entourage of soldiers that get in your way more than they help. You dig a bit deeper, there's rhythm games, collectibles, and enough quick time events to appease the Quantic Dream fan base. The only breaks in gameplay are for interludes which serve as a place to spend your upgrade points and see how your comrades feel about your moral actions. Upgrades come in the form of boosts to your two powers, Carnal Rage which is an increase to your damage while making you invincible, and Heroic Storm which buffs you and your soldiers. 
These are attached to a moral binary system. The more you use one, the more the meter sways at the end of a level. Keep in mind that moral binary systems weren't all the rage at this time. Bioshock had only come out two months prior. This wasn't the big trend following move that it would be in years to come. Big difference is that Bioshock's system was straightforward and not intrusive to the narrative, whereas Beowulf's tries to deeply root itself in the whole experience. If you end the level with good karma, you only get upgrades for the heroic storm and vice versa. On paper, it makes sense, but in order for this to work, the AI needs to be programmed in such a way that they react to the powers you're using, i.e. running away from carnal rage because for some reason it locks on to everything including friendlies, or running towards Beowulf when heroic storm starts. There also should be more clear markers as to how using something will affect your score at the end. I tried not using carnal rage as much as I could, but I would still end up with bad karma. Then I would try to recenter that with some good karma, but I would barely get half back. I get where this could be seen as a good design choice and that it makes you question using your evil powers, but that would require some fixes in the gameplay department, namely in streamlining the fighting sequences. You have no real idea how much health an enemy has, which builds tension in the wrong way creating a palpable frustration. The same enemy variety will take a different amount of damage based on the weapon you're using, the power up you use, or how many soldiers get to it before you join the fight. This wouldn't be an issue if there were just health bars. But now every fight is a guessing game. Your weapons are constantly breaking, so you have to get a new one. There's no pacing with battles either, so you just keep mashing quick attack until you get the option to move on. This only gets worse with mini bosses who have far more health, do a lot more damage to you, your soldiers, and the objective. This is where I ended up using the evil tack, Carnal Rage, the most, out of sheer desperation for not wanting to restart my progress. Now, boss battles get a health bar, and they proved to be the easiest part of combat. Beowulf the game would be significantly more playable if enemies had health bars and there was some consistency with the attacks. But we know he dies at the end, so what is the point of the karma system other than how people talk about you in the interludes? The three things this game needed to do right were narrative consistency, creating combat that makes you feel like the titular character, and keeping the player engaged with the karma system. The first point was dead on arrival, despite being given every opportunity to add a bit of flavor in the second act, instead choosing to beat the player overhead by verbalizing the subtext of the film. The second part fails because the systems don't work together in a way that gives the player agency to truly rip and tear as if they were a titan among men. Men, instead minimizing your role to babysitting troops and solving door puzzles. And the third point is null because in the end, the only thing the karma system is good for is some optional dialogue and skill points based on your play style. So if the only game directly tied to the source material isn't good, how could I possibly make the claim that Beowulf is a dish best served in video game format? Beowulf is one of the oldest stories that we have, and its framework can be seen in quite a few linear video games. Because most people play games purely for the sake of adventure. Most voiceless protagonists fit the mold of Beowulf perfectly. The player's motivation can be imprinted upon the main character, and for the most part, we're not playing linear video games with grand intentions, but instead just wanting to save the day. There are a lot of video games that follow this format, whose goal at the end of the day leads the player to be excited by adventuring and kicking ass for the sake of doing just that. While these works don't have direct connections to the poem, the narrative framework that Beowulf sets forth all those years ago can easily be seen in these examples and many others. Take your favorite linear story and see if it fits into this framework. First, arrival to a destination in need. Second, defeating of the direct threat which acts as a misdirection while another bigger threat comes into play. Third, a much more difficult battle is fought, but the land becomes safer afterwards. Fourth, a final monster, much bigger than the other two, comes into the picture. The hero saves the day, but suffers a great loss. This approach sort of works as a modified hero's journey. Instead of 12 steps, there's four. That simplification works wonders for video games because it gives the player and developers more space to play within the narrative. With this framework, we can look at Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I'll keep it spoiler free, so things might be a bit vague. 
but first you wake up with a touch of amnesia to find that the local people are in distress, but nothing is kicked off yet. Second, you're tasked with opening the Temple of Time, which requires collecting the Spirit Stones. To do so, you have to defeat three monsters. Third, in order to reconnect the Seven Sages, you must defeat five monsters. And fourth, you fight Ganon and you lose something dear. Though, some might disagree how tragic the loss is, but nonetheless, a loss is a loss. If that one wasn't enough, how about another example? Red Dead Redemption 1. This one's gonna be a little hard to keep vague, but I'm gonna do my best. First, John arrives in Blackwater. Second, John teams up with the Pinkertons to tie up some loose ends. Third, John takes out the biggest loose end. I think that's the best way to put it. And finally, a bigger force comes to fight John and uh, the things, things happen. I hope this gets the point across because I refuse to ruin Red Dead Redemption for anyone. But there is one definitive Beowulf game and that's Skyrim. Obviously, Skyrim takes a lot of cues from other fantasy properties. King Arthur and Lord of the Rings are the two that jump to mind quickest, but Skyrim gives more than just a wink and a nod to Beowulf. Now, I could sit here all day and draw comparisons. There's trolls, hag ravens, dragons, mead halls, Anglo-Saxons, and even Hrothgar gets a nod with a fort named after him. I can't fit the main story into the framework that I set above, but that's not important because those aren't the reasons why Skyrim is the best Beowulf game. First, and most obviously, it's the feeling of being a titan when you play. Beowulf's main goal is to fight monsters, gain wealth, and spread it to his people. And that's about it. You, the player, knowing how powerful you are, go on to hunt for missions, trying to help people because it's fun. Sure, you're given the option to murder everyone on sight, but most people booting up this game for the first time are excited to become super powerful and save the realm. And second, it allows for the oral tradition to continue. While Skyrim may be one of the most replayed games of all time, and there are no stones left unturned in terms of narrative found within, that doesn't stop everyone who's played it to have troves of stories at the ready for anyone who starts a lively discussion. I remember being on my high school swim team when the game was released in 2011. Almost every single one of my teammates was telling some kind of fantastic tale of how they slayed a dragon with a dagger or cleared a bandit cave without taking damage. I was lucky enough to have a teammate who enjoyed the game so much that they lent me their Xbox 360 and their Prima strategy guide so that I could join in on the conversation. The odd thing is that this discourse didn't just stay in the winter of 2011. I had friends who would pick up the game for the first time at least once every year after that, and everyone around them would eagerly join in the conversation with their own encounters. Some would be similar, but the way the story morphed and grew over time kept things fresh and exciting. In this regard, Skyrim is the best adaptation of Beowulf as it gives you all the resources to become the mythical being while honoring the historical tradition with which that story came to us in the first place. At its core, Beowulf is a historical poem, shaped not only by the centuries of study conducted around it, but also those who participated in its shaping. Beowulf is a framework with which we can tell stories of unfettered heroics, but leaves enough space in between the lines for creative leeway. Films have seen this opening as a way to add B-plots or deepen character connections, while video games have used it to create spaces where players fill in those actions with their own choices. In doing so, a true retelling of Beowulf allows for every player to participate in the grand oral tradition of this story, which is quite a remarkable feat for a poem of which we don't even know the name of the author.